Good evening. On behalf of Engineers Australia, I'm delighted to welcome you all to our Thought Leader series, Concrete Sleeper Retaining Walls. My name is Amanda and I'll be your host for this evening. Firstly, in keeping with our custom, Engineers Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and recognises their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to them and their cultures and to Elders past, present and emerging. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that today's webinar is being hosted with Engineers Australia's industry partner, Austral Masonry. Austral Masonry is one of Australia's largest manufacturers of concrete masonry blocks, retaining walls, pavers and stone products. Its commercial solutions include coloured and standard masonry, blocks, large scale segmental block retaining wall products, as well as a range of hard stand solutions, such as commercial and permeable segmental block paving. Throughout the past 110 years, the face of building materials has continued to evolve. We're here for a lifetime of living. This is Brickworks. More than brick, and more than just building products. We are a foundation for today's lifestyle and a leader for today's style. We manufacture a wide range of building products. Products like no other. Local and international innovation. Sourced from around the world to exceed customer expectations. Distinctive and luxurious products. Beautiful products that stand the test of time building inspiration and innovation with an unmatched standing of style. This is Brickworks. Today we will hear from two speakers followed by a live audience Q&A and I encourage you to send questions through to our speakers via the YouTube chat box. I'd now like to welcome our first speaker, Vishu Balakrishnan. Bijou brings over 25 years of experience working both government and private organisations in various countries. A Fellow of Engineers Australia and Chartered Professional Engineer, Bijou oversees the technical aspects of project delivery national for Intrex Housing. Bijou's experience pans across different sectors, including major state infrastructure projects, council projects and large housing projects. In addition to the vast experience in Australia, Bijou has also worked in the Middle East, India, Bangladesh, and worked on projects in Africa, Afghanistan, Vietnam, and Sri Lanka. Please welcome Bijou Balakrishnan. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, I'm Bijou Balakrishnan, a National Technical Manager for Interax Housing. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, concrete sleeper retaining wall. So, so these are the topics which I'm going to cover. Uh, first, I'll be talking about structural design aspects, and then I'll, I'll move on to build and construction, and then I'll discuss a few strategies for reducing cost and mitigating risk, and some conclusions. So when you design a sleeper retaining wall, you're actually designing four elements. First is concrete sleepers, second is steel post, third is pile, and four very important drainage arrangement. So if you design these four elements, then the sleeper designing, the, the, the sleeper uh, design is complete, concrete sleeper design is complete. The standard which you're going to use is 4678, uh, which is uh, released in 2002, which is a bit old now. Uh, but remember, it doesn't cover large retentions. When I say large retentions, uh, any retaining wall more than 15 meters, unusual soil conditions, cyclic loading, water retaining structures and bridge structures. If you are designing any of those things, you have to refer to applicable design uh, Australian standards, uh, similar to AS5100. For example, for bridge uh, structures, you should be referring 5,100. Before you start uh, designing a uh, sleeper retaining wall, you have to classify the retaining wall into uh, either A, B, C. 
So this classification is entirely depending on the, the damage it can cause if it fails, whether it is significant or moderate or minimal. So if it's minimal, you classify it as an A, but if it is uh, if it is a significant damage, then you classify the retaining wall as C. So this picture explains uh, how we classify retaining wall. Uh, so for example, on your left-hand side of the screen, uh, you can see a retaining wall, which is class A, which is no consequence, a backyard retaining wall. Whereas if your retaining wall is near a railway line, then definitely that will be a high consequence and then you should classify it as class C. Classification is also important because that also defines what kind of uh, geotechnical investigation you need to do. S4678 actually gives you an idea about what kind of investigation based on the classification. For example, if it is a class C retaining wall, you, you definitely you need to do global stability analysis. Whereas if it is a class A, you, you don't need to do that because uh, you know it's, it's a consequence. Mostly it will be smaller retaining wall and very rarely you know, you'll have a, a global uh, failure global stability issue but again having said that if if you have cascading sleeper retaining wall you need to check uh, for uh, global stability um, uh, even though if it is a uh, class b or class a surcharge the minimum surcharge is also based on uh, the the classification of your retaining wall and uh, 2.5 uh, uh, kpa if it is b and c and 1.5 kpa if it is a but again, as you can see from the table, the load actually reduces uh, the if, if the slope of the re uh, retained soil is more than one in four. The reason is if you have a sloping ground, very rarely you can get higher surcharge loading. Uh, you can't get any any mesh, uh, any um, uh, <coughs> any equipment or any um, vehicle up there because you know it's too sloping. So that's why you, you could actually reduce uh, the, the surcharge. Um, ultimate limit design. So it's a limit state design because uh, you know now very, very rarely we employ uh, the working stress method. So in limit state design, you have to look for strength and stability and uh, also serviceability. So in sleeper uh, retaining wall design, you have to do all these things. Um, the, only, the only difference is Probably the sliding is not a big issue for a sleeper retaining wall because you have uh, piles going into the ground. So very rarely a sleeper retaining wall fades by sliding, but rotation and deflection definitely uh, you need to check. And also in retaining wall design, most of the time, the ultimate failure uh, will not be the critical criteria because uh, you need the retaining wall has to deflect a lot to reach that stage and uh, the, the retaining wall will fail before it reaches the final ultimate state. So serviceability check is very important. Factor of safety. Factor of safety, uh, uh, lot of factors are important and, and, and 4678 uh, gives you an idea about lot factors. And uh, for dead load it is 1.25, not 1.2. And uh, for uh, groundwater, you don't need to factor anything because very rarely you can increase the density of water. Uh, and it's impossible. Um, and uh, and uh, for live load, it is 1.5. But remember, if you when you use uh, when you use 5,100, especially when you're designing large retaining walls, sleeper retaining wall for infrastructure projects, you'll be using 5,100. And the load factors are a little bit different if you use 5,100. For example, traffic loading, the uh, the, the the factor is 1.8 not 1.5. Design life, uh, 4678 also gives you an idea about uh, the design life of retaining wall and uh, it's a little bit different to what uh, you see in NCC or another, other standards. For example, if you are de designing a house, the, the life is 50, but here uh, as per 4678, uh, the, the, the life of a retaining wall for residential dwelling is 60. I think that is also will be corrected in the in the new code. Maybe this is coming from old standards. And uh, if when you are using for uh, large uh, uh, retentions and infrastructure projects, the life uh, design life is hundred, not not uh, fifty or sixty. Uh, design components. So as I 
previously you're actually designing four elements including the the, the drainage and the first is the sleepers sleepers are simple structures simply supported beams if you are using concrete sleepers you design a simply supported beam using 3600 and the post is a simple uh, steel cantilever so you can use 4100 to design steel post uh, and you can also calculate the deflection um, and mostly the steel is uh, used, uses universal columns are used as uh, posts. The reason is it has a bit more bigger flange. And the pile design, it's a laterally loaded pile. So you have to design a laterally loaded pile based on, on, on what kind of uh, horizontal force you're getting. Um, and uh, concrete piles are mostly unreinforced for retaining wall up to 1.5 to 2 meters uh, because most uh, the the stability, the strength of concrete uh, will not be the critical thing there because the deflection, when you design for deflection, you don't get that much moment. And even if you get a moment, uh, you know, the, the concrete has steel in it, so it's a composite action. So rarely you need to check that if, uh, if the retaining wall is less than 1.5 meters. But if it is more than bigger retaining walls, especially when you're using for infrastructure projects, you need to check that as well. And uh, you will end up providing uh, steel gauges uh, into the pile. Um, so the theory is a bit complex because laterally loaded piles are complex creatures. So you don't you th there is no simple method to to design laterally loaded piles. Uh, but uh, we, there are some methods which which will be quite handy for uh, designing sleeper retaining walls. And uh, you, you have to calculate uh, two things. One is the ultimate moments and shear forces, and also you have to check the deflection, uh, and uh, you have to design accordingly. Analysis method, uh, you can adopt uh, two uh, methods. Uh, one is, uh, uh, I would say, conservative methods, and the other one is accurate methods. For sleeper retaining walls, mostly conservative methods are quite handy because accurate methods needs a lot of computing time and uh, uh, effort. And probably that uh, that won't uh, give that much advantage if you're just designing a retaining wall on top, say, two meters. So the difference between these two methods are uh, conservative methods will, uh, it's very difficult to calculate the deflection in a conservative method. So what you do is you design for ultimate and then, you know, hopefully it will be all right for deflection. So that's a disadvantage uh, with the, uh, uh, conservative method. Having said that, Brom's method, uh, even though it is a conservative uh, method, it, it has some uh, uh, through Brom's method, you can actually calculate uh, deflections. Um, but again, if you are designing large retention systems, you're not going to use those methods. You have to resort to accurate methods, which is based on FEM packages like Plaxis or Abacus. Or, uh, uh, there are so many uh, commercially available softwares are available to design uh, at the piles. And uh, finally, what you get from all this analysis is deflection and bending moment and shear force. So deflection, you make sure that it is within within the limit and uh, uh, the uh, bending moment and shear force, uh, you design your pile, uh, you design your pile capacity to suit the, the applied bending moment and shear force. Manufacturers charts are available, which is quite handy to design sleepers, sleeper retaining wall. There are a lot of manufacturers who make uh, concrete sleepers and retaining, and, and they provide manufacturers chart, which you can use, which is quite handy. But remember, always check their assumptions. For example, this one, a chart which is uh, which which you can use if you are designing a class A, and uh, the surcharge is only up to 2.5. So, so that is the only thing you need to be aware of. You need to check uh, the manufacturer's assumptions. Because all these charts are prepared based on some calculations, based on some assumptions. So you need to make sure that, uh, that your project's uh, uh, details are matching with those assumptions. Um, nothing great in you know preparing a very good set of calculation unless you put all those things in your good set of drawings. Because that's what finally going to get constructed. So the builder should get all the information uh, necessary to to construct the retaining wall. So drainage you have to show correctly the drainage arrangements. You have to show uh, the inclination of the retaining wall, the pre camber. That's a good practice to have a pre camber because even if it deflects, you know it, it's not going to have a serviceability issue. 
and also um, you know the top capping a layer of clay so that uh, the surface water is not going into the into the uh, fully drained material so those kind of things are very critical buildability and construction um, sleeper retaining walls are quite popular because most of the stuff you can buy off the shelf like the the when i say off the shelf the only thing you're constructing at at the site is the concreting of the pile other than that, the sleepers you can you can get because people can precast and stock it, and even if uh, we are using steel, you don't need any welding. You can just cut and, and and use it. So that's why the sleeper retaining walls are quite attractive to builders. It can be constructed quite quickly and immediately can be used. Like uh, the once the concrete is set, the the building the retaining wall is ready to use. So, and also the other thing is it can be constructed from the lower side without going to the higher side. So that's why it is quite popular if you're constructing a retaining wall next to a boundary. So you don't need to trouble your neighbor, uh, uh, you know, requesting access and all. And you can construct very safely a sleeper retaining wall at boundary. Uh, best practices uh, to avoid the risks of failure um, especially when you're inspecting retaining walls, uh, these things are important. You need to make sure that uh, the, the builder has actually drilled to the correct depth because that's that's all uh, you are laying on, the passive resistance of soil to, to support uh, the retaining wall. And also the position of the steel post, it has to have the correct spacing and slope and all so that has to be checked. And uh, the other important thing is when you're installed sleepers, it should have enough bearing because if, if you don't have bearing, it can come out or it can have a bearing failure. So the stresses at that point will be very high for a concrete sleeper. So you, you get cracks. What to avoid? So you can see on the left hand side of your screen how much uh, uh, bearing it has, maybe 5 mil, 10 mil, that's not good enough. So we need to avoid those kind of installations. And the second thing, you can see the drainage agi pipe is actually at higher level. You need one in 100 slope for agi behind the retaining wall. So uh, unless you you know check those things and make sure that that can be discharged into a legal point of discharge, so you will end up like this. So what happened here is the builder actually put the agi discharge into the front of the retaining wall. And uh, what will happen? Uh, the, the passive uh, resistance of the soil in front of the soil will be gone because the clay doesn't have much uh, strength uh, when, it, when it is wet. And the third one you can see on the right hand side, the inclination. So this is a retaining wall where it was installed, installed like this. It was just not deflected, it was installed like this. It was, but the, the, the client complained that oh, your retaining wall is deflecting. But apparently it was installed wrong. So these things are important. and this, things should be avoided. Reducing cost and mitigating risk. So for re re reducing cost, the most important thing is you should have a detailed geotechnical investigation so that you know your soil, so you can you can uh, calculate the appropriate uh, impediment depth. Um, design life and durability is important because the steel we are using exposed steel, right? So you, you know, you, you need to specify the correct uh, coating so that it can last for intended life. Construction access is important because for constructing a sleeper retaining wall, you need to get machinery in. Um, so uh, that is important. Uh, if, if there is no access to a backyard and uh, the client wants to construct a sleeper retaining wall, you know, you need to think how it can be constructed because you can't get any machinery there. Spacing and pore size, that's sort of standardized by the industry at the moment uh, you know if you go for a concrete sleepers you get either 1.82 or 2.4 so maybe you get some other sizes from some manufacturers but that's sort of standard spacing you get um, surcharge and deflections are important make sure that you have uh, uh, you know you have the uh, slope the pre camber so that even if it deflects it doesn't have much issues drainage arrangement super critical because if you have a clogged drain what will happen? Blow the agi, agi pipe, you get additional surcharge loading, and uh, which you may not have designed for. Regular inspections and maintenance are also important because you need to make sure that the drainage arrangements are uh, 
working and uh, none of the aggies will be lasting 50 years without maintenance you need some maintenance at some point so that especially with the larger when you use for larger uh, uh, constructions or uh, infrastructure projects the, the maintenance of sleeper retaining walls are very important and future loading, you should also be worried about future loading. So conclusion. So the main thing of, of, about sleeper retaining wall is that uh, they are very easy to construct. And that's why it's very popular with the builders. And it's very cost effective because most of the stuff are, can be uh, uh, fabricated off-site. Um, when we are using sleeper retaining wall for uh, public works, then we have be aware of the lot factor changes. And drainage and deflections are critical because it's, it's actually related because if you don't have much good drainage, your deflection can increase due to additional surcharge, uh, additional loading due to water pressure. Construction access, safe method of installation, storage, et cetera, et cetera to be considered when you're when you designing sleeper retaining mode. The, the fourth point I've already discussed, it can be constructed from the lower side and you don't need to go to the upper side and you can construct safely. That's probably one of the best uh, use of uh, sleeper retaining wall. That's why it's very popular with uh, residential construction. A detailed geotechnical investigation necessary for optimal solution. I mean, you know, it's always better to spend some money on your geotechnical investigation uh, rather than just a, you know, simple uh, soil, soil report uh, so that uh, you, can, you can optimize your design and careful use of uh, soil parameters because you don't know, you don't want to be too conservative and you don't want to be unconservative as well so that is uh, that is the conclusions uh, thanks for listening and uh, thank you thank you vision i now like to welcome our second speaker russell brown russell is the founder and managing director of ri brown limited and over the past 50 years, um, Russell has represented the Institution of Engineers, the Foundation of Footing Society, and the Association of Consulting Structural Engineers Victoria on the Building Control Act Committee as an industry advisor to ensure that the build covered the needs of engineers. As a practicing consulting engineer, Russell assisted Australian standards in the preparation of AS4100 Handbook Limit State Steel Code to facilitate design engineers transferring from AS1250 to Limit State Philosophy. Please welcome Russell Brown. Hi there. Uh, thank you, Amanda, for the introduction. And thank you to Bijou for uh, his marvellous presentation for which I now hopefully will demolish your comfort zone thinking that it's going to be useful. My job is basically to prove to you what you should not do. More importantly, the amount of information that you will need to make sure that your designs and the responsibilities you are taking are safe, at least for you, and that no stupid errors creep through. Therefore, do have a look at the introduction slide. And this is a project that we were working on just a few months ago. In fact, I thought I might have to go back a few years, but all the slides are basically in the last 12 months or less. So as you can see, this is a timber wall, not concrete, first mistake. Secondly, you can see that it's leaning. Thirdly, look, the tall sleepers are in fact the ones that were put in to correct the error. Error next door decided they wanted a flat garden bed because the ground slopes down at about one to five, one to six. So they built it up 400 mils. Question, what's wrong with just a lousy 400 mils? Pretty easy. The bending moment applied to the base of the uprights is H cubed, not H squared, H cubed. Therefore, when one goes from one metre high approx to 1.4 metres high, you go from a bending moment of 1 to a bending moment of 1.96, rounding that up, doubling your bending moment. Hence the reason it failed. Next. Without going to an engineer, 
They come up with like and similar, and they put in the taller uprights using some coach bolts. They're going to rust out. But foolishly, because they're at the back of a house, they can't get in with a post hole digger, so they dig it by hand, putting in some concrete, not terribly good, and the area at the base is in fact, sadly, disturbed. Thus, they haven't actually achieved anything. Look just above the palings and you will see the fence has got a marvellous lean on it. Nothing has really worked. This became one of lawyers and litigation. And I believe that uphill, changed hands, new owners had no idea what had occurred, but ultimately agreed to correct same. You will note this is timber, not steel. You will note its horizontal planks stressed to the limit. Okay, essential formulas. I've gone back to Reynolds and Steedman, 1976 edition, which contains all the basic mathematics you'll ever need to work out the forces above ground. These are absolutely essential, but today we use different formulas to work things out, but not that different. If you wish to get these, you will need to track down Reynolds and Steedman, or you can send an email to my office if you wish. Essential data. This is very useful because it gives you the background of information on material likely to go behind a retaining wall, including clays, sand, etc. Problem is, this one doesn't include hydrostatic pressure. This one does include hydrostatic pressure, but what it doesn't tell you is the swelling force laterally, not vertically, on a retaining wall where highly reactive clays containing sodium monomillamide are concerned, terribly, terribly well distributed in practically all major cities in Australia, Perth being one of the few that's excluded. Here is an example of what not to do. Protection works were actually almost initiated because the engineer, when he drew his building, i.e. the excavated site, drew his one-to-one -one angle and realised that he was in the correct position for the foundations of the house next door. <clears throat> Problem was, he didn't take into account the concrete paving beside the building. Whoops. Foolishly, however, the builder excavated first as opposed to putting in a board hole, putting his steel post in, concreting it in, and then excavating downwards while the timber planks, in this case, were being used. Again, error, error, error. We went back to the site and discovered in the first three photographs, ignore the bottom right, that a prop had been put in and that holes had been dug. Wow. Then, for some reason, unbeknownst to me, they put in the retaining wall, noticing the prop's bottom right-hand photo. And you can see, damnably hard to get that Aggie drain in, which is on the drawings, which is needed, or else the hydrostatic pressure will get you. Question, which one of you watching would willingly go behind that wall and put the Aggie line in? Dangerous. What was needed in the first place was a construction sequence. What was needed in the second place was a fix-it sequence, none of which was done. Now, methods of rectification. Why was it needed? Well, have a careful look. We have non-galvanised material 
with timber, which has acids in it, and we have soil packed up behind these timber planks, noting we are actually underneath the building. Then what you can see is that the timber has warped and moved. Did that stop anybody? No. They dug away the soil in the front, which is actually the walkway into these units, and then they poured concrete using the timber that was still there as formwork. Of course, the timber is going to rot, and you can also see that it rotting it has, bottom left-hand photo, and also somebody got clever realising the timber wasn't a good idea and went out and got some roofing iron, bottom right hand, and guess what? It buckled. Why? Corrugated iron at best will span 1.2 continuously on a roof with just the odd human walking on it and maybe a bit of wind, but it certainly will not span 1.8, 2.4 with concrete being poured up against it of approximately a metre deep. Again, the design in the first place was atrocious and the correction methods were probably done by the same person. This one, same spot where we took the other shots, but this one is the party wall between the two units and what is badly shown, I apologise, is that the steel, ungalvanised, did go into something that was in fact resting on top of weathered rock with some concrete around it and ultimately was washed away and the whole thing is now not supporting the building. Worse, the plaster that you can just see is fire check to give a fire rating between the units. Clearly, it ain't fire rated now. Ah, here we have the glorious photos, etc., put up by our first speaker. Doesn't this look good? Well, have a careful look at what can go wrong. The answer is what can go wrong is that you didn't have enough information and that you will notice left-hand side of retaining wall, that the soil actually has in it a trench that is saturated with water, initiating swelling, increasing the overturning moment. Worse, somebody, possibly even our Telstra or similar, have put a trench in the front. And as a consequence, the pressures exerted, whilst they appear when being built to be in natural ground, the thickness of the natural ground between the pier and our trench may be as small as 300 millimetres. Thus, the stress diagrams to the right are bordering on useless. This highlights that you really do need to know what is physically there, and worse, you might have to guess what's likely to go there. In addition, some soil tests don't go deep enough or stop on rock and don't describe it. You will note that the board pier in this case goes deep enough to function. However, if the engineer stops it on the rock during construction, is there enough lateral force generated or do we have to socket it in? Question, has it been detailed? More importantly, and we'll go back again, You can see the Aggie pipe in behind the wall. Isn't that beautiful? But have a look at the length. The Aggie pipe needs a grade of at least 1 in 60 in reactive soils to make sure the clays and the silts wash through, or they need 1 in 100 if you're in sands. Question, if the wall is in the order of, say, 50 metres long, fairly short for a railway station, how do you grade the Aggie pipe? And if you don't grade it, water saturates. Here we are again, hopefulness at its best. 
What do we have to allow for? Well, we see we've got a fence. Well, maybe the fence isn't the start of your problem. What if somebody, and I haven't drawn this, plants a tree beside the fence, the tree grows up, and then the wind blows on the tree, the tree leans on the fence, so now we have a wind creature, potentially five metres high, applying a force to the top of our retaining wall. Normally, people building these structures are the lower level, and the people on the upper level want to plant trees for protection and visuals. Have we allowed for that in our design? Noting I haven't even drawn it. Next, see the anti pipe. How high? Where do you put it? If it's a long wall, you can't put it where you've drawn it. It's got to go higher or lower to get fall. Have you detailed, for example, pits either end to go in and clean it? Or worse, or better perhaps, have you just given up on the Aggie and analysed it for full hydrostatic pressure and swelling effects of clay? Noting that if you do have an Aggie pipe that's flat and you're in reactive soil, the moisture will seep out go to the front of the board pier, soften the ground, and thus accentuate the vertical height for which you should be analysing before you get resistance from the soil on the low side. Remember, it's H cubed, not H squared. Therefore, any time you increase the effective height, you are doing it to the cube. Best solutions, if you can do it, is on the lower level, put in some concrete paving. It generally slows people down putting in trenches. It also gives you a means of pushing water away, and it also gives you a means of creating a fixed horizontal force, if you can. You'll also note that I've shown four, three, sorry, little red uh, creatures. These represent what happens during a summer, i.e. the ground dries out, the retaining wall stays where it is, but we get vertical cracks in the soil. Generally speaking, there's a bit of fall towards this area or a garden bed. During the gardening season, we turn the soil, fills the cracks, winter comes, rains, the clay expands. Now it cannot expand laterally because we've filled them with sand and gravel. So which way does it expand? Well, basically upwards if you're lucky, but whatever expansion sideways is going to push your wall at a greater force than you probably allowed. This will come up towards the end of the presentation. Well, we're pretty close to the end. Knowledge gaps and questions, lack of information of retaining walls in reactive clays, quaternary basaltics put in there if you want. Uh, sodium montmorillonite is the creature that's nasty. You need to be able to find out if you're in highly reactive clays, that's any M or H criteria, what their lateral forces are if you can't control them. Make a hint, good drainage provided you can maintain it may help in this regard. Next, if you need some help or information from Reynolds and Steedman, contact my office by email. And finally, you may have ended up with a soil test and it may only be suitable for a residential structure, i.e. We're only putting in a small retaining wall, and therefore you may not have information as to what's a depth. Worse, you may pull up on rock, as we've shown, may not be a good idea. Or worse, you may be into a weak lower layer for which you've made no allowance. Make sure your soil test covers what it is you are analysing. Okay? Do not, under any circumstances, start designing serious retaining walls 
unless, by definition, you can make sure that you know exactly what you're retaining. To finish on a brighter note, you'll notice the photograph taken of a friend's house that I helped to design worked perfectly. Why? It's all sand resting upon sandy clay that is as rigid as all hell and everything above ground and behind the wall is sand. Golden news, if you can only ever design for sand behind your walls, you'll have no problems at all. On that, we also have more information if you'd like. A couple of groups that we belong to, AXEV and Foundations and Footing Society, are running a workshop on piles in August. If you can, please contact my office by email again for more information. Notes. I am leaving you all open to be asking questions, as I'm sure you have them, and we will look forward to trying to answer them as directly, as honestly as we can. But in the small break that I hope exists, you will have used your computers to determine that you really don't have a great deal of information on a whole range of projects. Therefore, questions, thank you for the, listening to me and hope I can help you in question time. Yours. Thank you. And thank you to Russell for offering to um, send further information to those email addresses that were in his final slide. I just wanted to point out tonight as well that we've had over 1,200 registrations. So this topic over the years continues to attract interest. And please, when you're filling in the survey uh, at the end of tonight's session, please feel free to put down um, topics that you would like to hear about as well. Um, thank you to Russell and Bijou, and it's now your turn to get involved. Um, a big thank you to everybody who sent through a question when they're registered. And also, you can now also send questions through the chat box in YouTube. And if you wouldn't mind just putting who your question is directed to. Um, we might start off with a question that's come in from Andrew in Queensland for Bijou. Um, and the question is, what is best practice for the design of tiered retaining walls? Bijou. Thanks, uh, Andrew, for the question. I think uh, the question is related with uh, how to analyze a tiered retaining wall. I mean, you can use uh, any retaining wall solution for a tier solution. You, you can even use uh, masonry. But I think the important thing is uh, you may need to do a global stability analysis um, because when you cascade uh, retaining walls, you know, you, there could be a chance of global failure. That is the first thing you need to be worried about. Second thing, if you don't want to do so, too, many, too many calculations, some of the thumb rules you can use, if you go high two, two times horizontal and do another one, most of the time you can get away with that. I think hopefully I answered that. Yeah, thanks, Bishu. Um, Just staying in Queensland, it's good evening to John. Uh, asking you, Bijou, should the wind load due to a fence be a separate load case? Thanks, John. Thanks, John, for the question. Yes, I think you need to consider that, but uh, it won't be that critical unless uh, you are in a you know cyclonic area or where you have uh, more than N3 or N4. But yes, uh, technically uh, speaking, you need to consider that. You need to have to add uh, that force into uh, your ultimate design calculations. Uh, and, uh, and I've done that calculation many times, but it's not really uh, critical uh, for small retaining walls. And uh, there are some uh, calculators available. I've seen, uh, for example, Clear Calcs uh, has a uh, module which you can actually put wind load into a sleeper retaining wall and calculate uh, the additional deflections and moments. Uh, and also you can change uh, uh, the, the wind uh, category from N1 to N N3. And I'm sure there will be other softwares available uh, which you can uh, use uh, to do that sort of uh, calculation. Thank you. 
Thanks, Bijou. And Bijou and Russell, if you feel like you want to jump in um, and add additional comments to a question, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, well, well, it's all happening. Um, Bijou is putting on the, the, the positive side of life. The problem is in a 50-year lifespan, people do plant trees hard against these fences. And even if you just analyze a tree that's not even touching the fence, the tree actually has to have some method of being supported by the soil. Thus, it can, in fact, induce forces into your retaining wall, which you've made no allowance. It's quite a problem. We already have two projects where the basic failure is trees being blown against the fence and in turn collapsing, in this case, a brick wall we're currently doing but the effect is the same on anything so i'm terribly negative about trees fences and retaining walls yeah i think that's true i mean you know trees are uh, difficult uh, you know things uh, and and most of the time when we design retaining walls uh, that information is not readily available and then sometimes the trees will be added later yeah that's correct i mean these are some unforeseen things which can happen uh, in retaining walls Thank mm -hmm. you. And I think it's it's all happening in Queensland tonight. So I encourage the rest of the country to uh, to send through questions. So Hamish, good evening to you in Queensland. Uh, asking um, Russell, um, how do you design for high pressure? Um, sorry, this is Christopher in Queensland. How do you design for high pressure due to expansive soils behind the retaining wall, Russell? Um, it's probably the, the nastiest question in the whole lot that I'm expecting to get. Um, there is very, very little research that I can find that accurately predicts horizontal pressure from moisture added into clay, and particularly if we're looking at sodium montramilmite. In Australian Standard 2870, I think it's Appendix G, they do give a force based upon the YS value, which I have determined is one excessively conservative and is only for vertical. It doesn't really take into account a lateral effect. And to date, I'm yet to find some reasonably authoritative work on what pressures you should allow for. The only one that I have ever heard of, and I could not get it substantiated, was the old Keelor Council, when designing a bridge over the Maribyrnong River, did put some pressure plates on the back of um, some piers for uh, a bridge already existing, and they put reactive clay up against it and measured the pressures. I believe it came in at about 20 kPa, as a force fairly uniformly. So some work has been done, but if you think about 20 kPa, that's a fearful amount of force as a uniform load. Hence, it's a H squared thing, not a H cubed thing. But not enough data to actually be 100% certain. Um, as I said, lastly, if you can get sand behind your wall, and only sand, you're living in dreamland. Bishu, do you have a view on that one? Yeah, I think uh, that's a difficult force to calculate, especially as we all know, reactivity is, we are still struggling to design our foundations for reactivity. So if you put that into a retaining wall, which is already complex with, uh, with uh, uh, embedded uh, laterally dotted piles, it's, it's a complex system. Uh, but I uh, think, uh, you know, using the vertical uh, pressure, which uh, Russell was talking about, probably we can have some assessment on the horizontal pressure and, uh, you know, design accordingly. And the other strategy, which uh, which is quite handy, is um, allowing the, the pre-camber for retaining wall, so that, you know, especially for sleeper retaining wall, if you can put the post at, a, at an angle, some of these kind of uh, deflections uh, can be handled because it's not going to, uh, you know, yeah, uh, create a serviceability problem uh, if it is still straight after after that movement. 
Thanks, mm, Peter. Agreed. Thanks, Russ. Thanks, guys. Um, over to New South Wales, I'm from Constantinos, is asking a question. I've come across this concept of, and this is for you, Bijou, I've come across this concept of a structural steel post with a steel rear bar forming the embedded bottom half of the post, but without stirrups. How is the lack of stirrups justified? Thanks for that question. Bijou. Yeah, that's, that's a good question, actually. Um, I haven't seen uh, that people are using uh, the vertical bars without stirrups, but uh, most of the time, a sleeper retaining walls up to 1.5 meters doesn't have any stirrups or even vertical steel, or it, it's just a, a normal concrete and, and, and the steel going into the concrete. One of the reasons is uh, when, you, when you do an analysis, uh, you will find that uh, the, the shear is not that critical because uh, you have 450 diameter piles. Even, even if you calculate uh, the shear capacity of unreinforced uh, uh, concrete, uh, that is more than enough uh, to handle the, the shear uh, forces of uh, smaller retaining walls. But uh, you can't do that uh, when you have uh, higher, uh, higher uh, retaining walls, especially when you're using for uh, uh, infrastructure kind of projects where uh, the, the, the horizontal forces could be high. So in, in that scenario, you need uh, both uh, the vertical steel and uh, uh, and stirrups. You might have seen uh, in in um, the st railway station construction or which is happening around Melbourne, most of the time they use a, a concrete sleeper retaining wall for infrastructure projects, uh, for car parks and all. Uh, they always use cages in um, concrete uh, uh, with the stirrups. But uh, that's not uh, being used in residential construction where the loads are less, the surcharges are less, and also the height of the retention is only around 1.5 or maximum 2 meters. So, yeah, you can avoid syrups, but uh, uh, not for uh, bigger retaining walls. Thanks, Bijou. Russell, do you agree? Um, well, actually, Bijou is far too young to actually know <clears throat> where this ridiculous theory, well, it's not so bad. Uh, Dr. Walsh, who was on the code committee for 2870, put forward the concept that shear in concrete that's in the ground permanently kept wet and thus unable to actually shrink and have cracks within it had a much higher shear capacity than concrete that was normal, i.e. above ground dries out, etc. <clears throat> and this is actually in 2870 that you have that disclaimer that says don't use 3600, ignore it. And you actually they're saying ignore um, your shear calculation because the concrete doesn't shrink, therefore it gets better shear capacity. But I think for a conservative attitude, you'd be well advised to analyse for shear. I think Bijou is right up to a given height, two metres, maybe even three, um, you'll find that the shear is fairly low. And by the time you get up those heights, remember your diameter of your embedment pile is getting bigger and bigger. So your, your shear capacity is going up and up. So yeah, it's probably okay to do, but I can't see why you do it because the complexity of actually welding bars onto your steel post and then galvanising all of that, transporting without bending them and putting it in, I don't think it's a terribly bright idea to be doing it anyway. It's certainly not simple. Thanks, Russell. And I think you've touched on something interesting there because in when we talked about, introduced you that you've had 50 years in the industry. So for our young engineers out there, do you feel that there's enough knowledge um, out there to support them, uh, going back from when you started out as a young engineer? Um, that's a terrible question, Amanda, actually. Um, <laughs> um, I, I know quite a few senior academics and they all cry at the fact that they don't really have enough time to teach um, what is in um, the Australian standards, particularly the five or four major ones. And as a consequence, they admit they have to cut corners and they admit that they tend to rely on computer programs that analyze for structures. 
And then because they're all in a black box, uh, the person running them actually doesn't really have a great handle on what it is they've actually designed. And um, yeah, I, th I think it is a problem for the young engineer. And I think it's a major problem that they probably don't realize they've got in the, um, as an example, I was asked many years back to attend a Senate hearing on Australian standards. And I took in the Australian standards for 1250, the old steel code. I took in the A5 size document um, and showed how big it was. I then produced what uh, 4100, which was its replacement, and it required a supplementary document, a complementary document, the code itself, a computer program, and three books from ASI before you could actually use it. And the point being, structures designed using the old 1250, when compared with the new ones, were within 5% the same answer. A heck of a lot of technical knowledge requiring you to use a computer for a massive gain, in some cases of 5% or less. Probably, I don't think advancement's been as good as we would like it to be, and I don't think practicality is top of the list at practically any university at the moment teaching structural design and structural analysis. Thank you. Mm. Thanks for that. Thanks for that, um, Russell. And I just want to stay with you, uh, Russell, because we've had a question that's come in from Hamish up in Queensland. Uh, good evening to you, Hamish. Asking, for existing retaining walls with insufficient drainage, what is a sound approach to improve drainage and reduce upstream ponding without compromising retaining wall? And Hamish goes on to say, would coring small holes into existing concrete sleepers be a potentially suitable approach to allow water to drain? Your thoughts, Russell? The answer, put simply, is yes. Um, in fact, practically all reinforced or any form of retaining wall tends eventually to have even its best drainage block, silt, sand, tree roots, whatever. And I even ride beside a fairly substantial retaining wall. And all they have to do to fix it is just remount the holes that were already there so that they get rid of the buildup of silt wrapped around tree roots and so on. So, but in specific terms, assuming you're using a concrete plank and a galvanized steel upright, and you start to get proof that it's blocking, that you're getting water buildup. If you can, find out where the reinforcement is in your concrete planks. And generally speaking, it will be a reasonable distance away from the sides. And then drill a hole, perhaps as small as um, 40 mils diameter, through the gap so that you're actually taking out 20 mils of one plank, 20 mils of the other plank, and put them in at 1.2 centres. Um, but at that diameter, you're going to go back and ream them out on a semi-regular basis. Um, at that size, tree roots are going to block them pretty rapidly and they may silt up. But uh, better than have the whole wall get, you know, collapse on you and rotate. But, um, the other method you can use, if you can, and if you own the upside, Remembering most retaining walls of this type go in as a consequence of the person at the lower end of the retaining wall wanting a flat area for their property. So the person uphill, generally speaking, doesn't get a great deal of value. So if you can go uphill, put in a concrete slab, raid the water away, pick it up before it gets behind the wall. Again, cost. That's Thanks, simple. Russell. Benji, simple do you want to come? Sorry, Russell. Two, two simple solutions. Stop the water getting there and get rid of it or drain it, but live with the fact you're up for maintenance. Yeah. Yeah, I'll just add uh, one. Yeah, just add one more point uh, to, to what Russell have already explained. 
uh, when we are taking out the water from uh, uh, by drilling holes probably it's a good idea to have some concrete paving on the front side of the retaining wall because we don't want the water to wet uh, the the clay and you know that's what we are laying on the passive resistance of soil to to work mm. so probably you know you should be worried about uh, draining out uh, the, the water without uh, getting into the soil yeah you and do not uh, want to drain this onto the ground you do not want to get this in your soil it will reduce yeah. bearing capacity of your soil the height of your retaining wall structurally goes up back to that h cube mentality I just wish more yeah. engineers would understand what cubed really means yeah and and the other the other thing i would add is uh, to russell uh, points is that uh, uh, the the details which we give where that is where i think uh, engineers have to improve a bit more because mostly we give some simple details and uh, leave the builders to sort it out so you have to give clear uh, you know drawings showing how the top should be capped with a clay layer if you are filling with the fully drained material behind the retaining wall because we don't want mm. to get all the surface water to get into the drainage uh, layer and uh, uh, the, the uggies are not good enough to, to to manage all the surface water it is just to you know drain out uh, the water infiltrated through the soil mm. not for the uh, surface water so so that is an important thing uh, to to detail in the drawings because if you are not detailing no one will construct it and uh, definitely the strategy for diverting the soil of water uh, with a cutoff uh, drain or a spoon drain so that's a very good strategy so because we don't want any any water near the near the retaining wall because it, it will only give you trouble yeah but uh, i think we're all overlooking which i said before probably the greatest number of retaining walls domestically uh, to satisfy the person on the downhill side of the retaining wall. So you then inflict on the, the correct decision is to have a concrete slab on the upper, capture that water and run it away. The worst scenario is to allow it to come straight down, saturate your aggie pipe and sooner or later you've got to drain it. Then that water you've got to capture so it doesn't destroy the soil that's retaining your retaining wall. Yeah. Catch 22. Thank you. Thank you for that. And as we are in the midst of um, a huge building boom here in Australia, um, we've had a great question around uh, long-term durability of sleeper walls. Um, this one's directed to you, Bijou, and it's coming from Peter, uh, who is again in Queensland. Good evening to you. It's quite a long question, so I'll take my time. And Peter is asking Bijou, there are significant concerns about the long-term durability of sleeper walls with concrete cracking likely because the reinforcement is on the neutral axis and steel corrosion likely because the steel is in a moist environment that will not generally be low in oxygen and could have a low pH. Peter goes on to say, should the walls only be used in non-critical applications that have full access for excavation and replacement in the future? Thanks, Peter. Bijou. Thanks, Peter. That's an excellent uh, question. Um, uh, I think uh, uh, generally the sleeper retaining walls are used for residential sort of applications where AS3600, probably not, uh, engineers are not really familiar with that because AS2870 is more than enough. Uh, but if you if you, if you you really design with AS3600 with the adequate uh, concrete uh, uh, strength for the um, uh, conditions, uh, and with adequate cover, I think you can get a higher durability, like 50 years or even. I have seen uh, sleeper retaining wall concrete sleepers are being used for infrastructure projects, but those sleepers are not the one you normally get off the shelf. Uh, they probably, you know, design and construct and uh, precast it separately, maybe with higher uh, steel and uh, uh, concrete uh, capacity. Um, so, yeah, yes, you can get uh, the durability up. Uh, you know, if if you design it properly, that is about the concrete sleepers. And um, um, coming back to the, the 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 steel post, steel posts generally uh, used are galvanized, and uh, you know galvanizing um, may not last fifty years. But uh, one thing you can do to uh, you know to increase or to manage the durability is you similar to the the strategy adopted for. Uh, 
uh, screw coils uh, which are galvanized and uh, you know put it into the ground you can actually design with a bit of sacrificial steel so you know in the uh, piling code uh, it is given uh, uh, how much uh, you know the, the the additional capacity additional um, uh, thickness you need to allow for based on the durability that's another strategy you can adopt uh, to to take care of uh, the durability issue issue of the post and below ground i think it is pretty all right because you know your, your steel is within the concrete and uh, even if you put uh, regular steel reinforcement just like any pile uh, as long as you have uh, the necessary cover you will be uh, you know, you'll be all right with the durability issues i think most of the time what happens is uh, you know the manufacturers uh, the, the one you are buying uh, off the shelf may not be suiting your purpose so you know that is where i think russell mentioned about the geotechnical investigation so you need to know your soil whether it is contaminated whether it has any other sulfates or chlorides or those sort of things and where is it is located is it near coastal so you know if, if you really apply the strategies of s3600 to, to deal with that i think you'll be all right um, a, little, a little comment on that um, whilst I love the concept of sacrificial steel, um, because it means there's more steel to be used, the problem is if you've got a retaining wall, for example, at a railway station, and it starts off with beautiful galvanised verticals, lovely pieces of concrete, and you've allowed a rusting rate of, say, uh, two millimetres, how do you sell the public the local councillors, all of them, that here we have a retaining wall that for 30 years out of its 50, we're going to have red stains running down and everybody's going to be asking, how much has it rusted? And then the other dirty question that comes in, what if you check the rust in a spot that it hasn't rusted greatly and the real problem is it's rusting somewhere you can't test on the inside of the wall and it's about to collapse? The concept of allowing rust to be visible in this environment is not a great idea. Heavy duty galvanising and then perhaps coated with a high build epoxy and then another coat to protect it from UV light. It's a visual thing. People will panic on visual amenity. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I mean, you know, it's it is impossible uh, to keep a retaining wall without some sort of maintenance. So I would expect uh, at some stage, uh, you know, there will be uh, some sort of inspections and rectification and, and checking, making sure that, you know, the, the rust is not, uh, has eaten away all the steel. So uh, I think for uh, infrastructure projects, probably they will have a maintenance regime where someone, some sort of asset inspections will be happening and uh, any of these kind of things will be captured. Uh, but yes, uh, you're right, Russell, uh, for public works, sometimes, you know, they construct it, left it there for, you know, till it uh, comes to a point where it is going to collapse. So, the, wow. yes, I think uh, that is where the problem is. Uh, we are not looking after our assets. I mean, people think something is constructed can be will last uh, 50 years without looking after it. Mm. Yes, a uh, large number of people believe 50 years is minimum. I was just going to ask you that question as we're looking for more sustainable solutions. Um, are we talking 50 years, Russell? Um, sustainable solutions. I mean, it, it's a matter of how you look at it. Um, if, for example, you, you put in a reinforced concrete um, column um, and, and for whatever reason it lasts 50 years, but let's just assume that, so what do you do with it? You, you, you jackhammer it down, you can maybe recycle the aggregate into some form. The reinforcement's probably difficult to separate out. So you have a, a complex situation at the end of 50 years you demolish. On the other hand, if your steel beam or U-beam or whatever goes below a certain figure safety-wise, you can extract it and you can melt it and reuse it. Whilst everybody thinks steel is probably not as good as concrete, at the end of 50 years, it's probably more recyclable than the equivalent strength reinforced concrete creature. So 
there might need to be a slight improvement in our education as to what is really sustainable and end result sustainability. And certainly timber uh, in retaining walls does not get a big nod. Mm. That's really, yeah, interesting to hear. Um, we've had a question. It's a pretty broad question that's come in from Stuart in New South Wales. Good afternoon to you. Asking you, Russell, how do you deal with poor information on the geotechnical side? So interpret that as you will. That's easy. Go out and do the test yourself. Um, if you're smart enough as a structural engineer to know that the soil test you've got is useless, you're probably able to go out and correct for it. Or you do know a geotech that knows how to do it properly. Remember, Retaining walls, particularly in a domestic environment, involve two parties, one of whom is probably not happy with the retaining wall or eventually becomes unhappy with it. Litigation should be top of your list. So the answer is if you've got a geotech report that hasn't gone deep enough, i.e. you need three metres to get your pile to work, and the soil test stops at 1.5, you need another soil report. If it turns around and says it's a H clay, but doesn't tell you, is that caused by sodium melamide, calcium melamide, what the heck is actually causing it? Then you really have got a problem. So lousy soil tests accepted by engineers I'm not quite sure who I would like to blame the most, the badly done soil test or the person who accepts them and designs anyway. Both have a problem. Thanks, Russell. I suppose that brings in the whole concept of the of other stakeholders in this field. Bijou, um, what, what sort of improvements have you seen or what sort of challenges, opportunities in, 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 the, in for the engineering profession when working with, with other stakeholders, including geotechnical engineers? Yeah, I think uh, uh, structural engineers need to, from my experience, need to interact a lot more with the geotechnical engineers. Uh, and uh, because uh, I think sleeper retaining wall is the best example uh, where you cannot design an optimum uh, uh, design without uh, having a discussion with your geotechnical engineer. And sometimes you need his, uh, as a structural engineer also, you need to understand uh, a bit of geotechnical engineering if you really want to design sleeper retaining wall. Uh, from my experience, I've seen that uh, engineers uh, struggle to design sleeper retaining wall because uh, structural engineers, the understanding of uh, geotechnical parameters uh, those kind of things are a bit low at the moment so they struggle to understand uh, the, the geotechnical side of things um, uh, so, th so i think that has to improve uh, from a from a design perspective uh, from a stakeholder perspective look i think the retaining walls are uh, complex structures and it's not easy to put a retaining wall uh, especially if it's the boundary so definitely you need to have a discussion with your uh, client and uh, especially the builder if the builder is on board you need to understand what is his preferred method of construction, what he is comfortable with, um, and especially you know the, the what kind of machines and access uh, and access he has got. So uh, I always tell engineers that uh, you you cannot put a, a particular kind of retaining walls in 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 all scenarios. For example, sleeper retaining wall is best solution uh, for a, a boundary condition. Uh, whereas some other solutions may not be suitable. So that doesn't mean that that sleeper retaining wall is uh, suited for old application. So that is where I think the stakeholder involvement comes in, uh, the, the builder, the client, and sometimes even the neighbor, because if you're constructing a retaining wall at the boundary, he has a say whether he is happy to accept uh, what solution you're proposing. And, uh, and now with the protection of notices and all, you cannot just put a retaining wall which uh, you are comfortable with. So I think uh, it's important uh, uh, to have a consultation with your stakeholders. 
uh, especially for the sleeper reta uh, the, the retaining wall things uh, if you're constructing a boundary. Mm. Thanks, Peter. Can't disagree. I'm not alone. Uh, that's water. I only have wine glasses in the office, so I have to drink my water <laughs> from them. So. Don't, don't think it's a good start. Take my word for it, it's not. Okay. What's the next question, Amanda? The next question is for you, and it's from Melissa Page. And Melissa's watching from New South Wales, and she's asking you, um, Russell, why are these types of walls suitable, and where should we not specify them? And she said, recommended offsets to services running in parallel to the wall. I think that might be a oh. question too. Yes, well, we almost cover that in one of my horrifying, you know, be wary. Um, if we're looking at services, um, both behind and in front. Behind, if they're going to get saturated and you get a high build-up of uh, hydrostatic pressure, uh, that your Aggie system and your crushed rock can't handle, it's good to know that that trench is there because you may well go to great lengths to put a concrete slab in to stop surface water, but you may have been putting it over a trench that's running water um, and accumulating behind your wall. Again, know what the heck you're actually building and trenches within I would suggest the height of the wall, that's the edge of the trench, not the centre line of the pipe, edge of the trench, should be at least the height of your wall away. Preferably a bit more. In front, it's deadly. Even a small trench for a um, gas main, which is shallow, water main, which is shallow, I mean, if they dig down um, three, 400 mils, it's that one metre high retaining wall cubed. It's a disaster. So you've really got to be pretty sure that nobody is going to put a trench or there isn't one already in front of your, your retaining wall. Answer, we have one in, um, I can't mention where, uh, most people know it. But they did use a methodology of horizontal planks onto mullions that were put in very similar to this type of construction. But somebody forgot to check the footpath has got three services in it within 600 millimetres from these vertical mullions. Therefore, when the vertical mullions carry most of the load going laterally, they're going to squash the trench and the wall's going to rotate. Sadly, it is. Hence my involvement. So answer, if you are going to have a trench put in front of your wall over which you can control, sure, do it, fill it with concrete. If you're going to have a trench uphill of your wall and it's close, get rid of the crushed rock, clay plug it and make sure that it can't flow water and make sure it's moderately compacted and then put a concrete slab over the top to capture surface water and block the trench that's behind your wall so it can't put water in behind you. I would hate to think that this was easy to do. Probably not. Thanks, Russell. Do you want to add to that, B2, or oh, you're okay? Yeah, I think uh, I agree. Like uh, trenches are difficult creatures to, you know, to put. Uh, and uh, you know, if you ask me honestly, I, I don't want any trenches next to my retaining wall because <laughs> no one can guarantee. Yeah, it's uh, the water leaking thing, and especially with the uh, the, the uh, reactive soils, uh, you know, we are, we are looking for a disaster. So I think you know the strategy is, is you know you can you have to do what best you could do and uh, hope for the best. Yeah, just Thanks. on that, I don't know whether many people, I did this about two years back, I asked the question, how many engineers actually live in the western suburbs and physically live on highly reactive soils? And the answer is not many. I think of 160 people I asked the question of at an AGS meeting, I think five or less put up their hand. 
So there really isn't personal knowledge on highly reactive clay. But something in the order of 0.9 million people in Melbourne live on highly reactive clays, and that number is not diminishing. That's a lot Thank of... You. And that's mm -hmm. our growth suburb of Werribee, mm -hmm. um, Melton and Sunbury. All reactive soils. Yes. So the only, the only real good news about them all is most of those suburbs are fairly flat and they tend not to need retaining walls. As a consequence, they don't get the problems we're talking about. So it's a bit of a catch-22. If you're on a flat site, you don't need a retaining wall. But, you know, it's... a yeah, don't don't get reactive clay in a sloping site. I mean, it's not good for you. Thanks, Russell. So, from reactive clay to wind effects, and, and Peter in New South Wales uh, asking you, Bijou, how can we deal with wind effects on solid fences attached to the top of these walls, Bijou? Uh, I think uh, we have already uh, discussed that the the wind on the on the fence is is that the same question or is it a different yeah. question? Sorry, apologies. I think we have had a similar question. Um, yeah, yeah, I think we have already discussed the the, the, the wind uh, on on the retaining wall, especially when you are okay. attaching a fence into it. And yeah, you, you have to consider that load into, into the retaining wall design. Okay, thank is, you. Is that Peter the same question or is it a different question? I think it was so. worded slightly different, but I think the the answer is pretty much the same. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm conscious of time, so we might um, move on to. Um, Zalifka in New South Wales who's asking you, Bijou, how to manage, how do we manage water drainage coming from retained material? Yeah, I think uh, the best method is uh, first thing you have to use a drained, fully drained material behind the retaining wall like a scoria or uh, that sort of material and then you have to put an agi pipe uh, below and uh, as Russell pointed out, the important thing when you put an agi pipe is the agi pipe has to be put in one in hundred slot. So you need to make sure that you can drain out, you can put the agis uh, in one in hundred slope and really connect with an NPD. That is what I've, uh, in my presentation, I have uh, shown a picture where, uh, where when I inspected, the agi was actually up high, one, 1 1.5 meter high, and it was actually, sorry, about uh, 0.5 meter high, and it was discharging into the front of the retaining wall, which is a disaster. So uh, I think one thing uh, from an engineering point of view, um, the, the engineer who designs retaining wall also has to make sure that someone documents the drainage arrangements. Either the structural engineer has to document it if he's uh, uh, engaged to do that, or he need to make sure that you know, someone else will be doing that correctly. Because otherwise, if you le uh, left that to the builder to sort it out, then you, know, you don't get uh, uh, the results and, and and in reality what happens is if you put an agi horizontal as Russell was pointing out that what is going to happen is the water is going to leak out there so instead of taking out the water the water is going to stay there damaging uh, you know the the the, uh, the wetting the clay and and swelling the clay and also that can also go into the front side of the retaining wall and and, and damage uh, the, the passive air pressure so it can uh, you know, bite back if it is not working. So, yep. Yeah, uh, to answer the question, you need to put an agi and make sure that it is it has a cloth around it so that it is uh, it is not clo uh, it won't clog quickly. But also remember, you need to have some drainage, uh, you know, clearing uh, holes, uh, clearing access from a pit, because otherwise, uh, it, uh, agis need maintenance. You know, someone has to clear out uh, uh, if it's not working. So, uh, so one thing, the design. Uh, having the correct slope and those kind of things. Second thing, you need to have a maintenance uh, arrangement so that uh, you, you at maintenance access so that you can actually clean it. Thanks, Peju. Um, Russell, we've had a question that's come in from Ashley. Good evening, Ashley, asking you, when designing the pile, how much soil be below the surface do you ignore structurally before lateral load can be assumed? to be supported by the soil. Thanks, Ashley. Answer. 
your geotech should tell you. That's the first thing. The good news is, in most cases, because you're putting in a retaining wall, you're actually cutting into the ground where the concrete uh, part of your structure uh, actually starts and then goes down. So generally speaking, you've got reasonably good ground, certainly not the topsoil that's loose, and to a large extent um, is, is competent material. On the other hand, if you're using topsoil and then you're building up a retaining wall to keep something above, you really need to exclude that topsoil from your calculations. Uh, a trick that you can use is to put a concrete pavement on top of that topsoil and use it as your horizontal component and force and make it wide enough to, to distribute your forces into your topsoil. Failing that, allow for the topsoil to be there and again, your HQ will grab you and you will be looking for alternative methods to just ignoring that soil. Um, it's the catch-22. The number of people who design a retaining wall, metre, metre and a half high, and you go on site and there they are, 500 a metre high because there was one section that wasn't levelled properly and the builder or whoever has decided well, we'll continue and do it. Go back to my first couple of slides where we've got this massive amount of, of height. My left hand thumb says they're probably not going to work if they get water behind them. It's, a, it's H cubed. Most of us can't think H cubed. We motivate WL squared on eight pretty well. Most engineers have got a rough idea. But the moment you get something with a cube in it, well, left hand thumb's gone to hell. That's the problem. Thanks, Does that Chester. answer your question? No, that's the problem. And I think we sort of we are running out of time, but we've had a great question that's come in from Mark in the Northern Territory. And I know we've talked about boundaries tonight, but uh, Mark's asking um, regarding earthworks. So Mark's asking, how important, Bijou, is it to consider the location of property boundaries when designing retaining walls and what allowance should be made for potential future earthworks near the retaining wall? Thanks, Mark. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Uh, that's an excellent question. I think... Uh, uh, when you put a, a retaining wall, uh, if it is at the re, uh, at the boundary, there are so many issues you need to be worried about. First thing is from where you are going to construct it, uh, which side, and uh, uh, and uh, how do you ensure that the other side? Uh, well, it, the important thing is whether you have access to the other side when you are constructing it. And most of the time, you don't have because the neighbor won't allow you uh, to to access. The, the neighbor's property, even uh, the neighbor will, won't allow to even uh, move the fence. So that is the first thing. Like, you know, you need to understand what are your limitations in constructing the retaining wall. And then only you can suggest what kind of retaining wall suits there. And uh, one advantage with the sleeper retaining wall is boundary is because you can actually do top down construction. Um, uh, you can actually put the sleep, uh, the, the, the post. Uh, and and then put the sleepers down and remove the soil and as we as you go you can actually put the sleepers down uh, and and put uh, add another sleeper on the top and continue that you can actually construct a retaining wall uh, safely without undermining the neighboring uh, um, ground so that's why sleeper retaining walls are quite popular but remember you can do that only if you have uh, sort of a, a clay soil. If it is sand, that becomes a little bit tricky. But uh, otherwise, if that's not ha uh, uh, working, then you need to resort to you know wild uh, solutions. So yes, uh, the the location is very important. Um, and uh, the other question was about uh, the future excavations, right? I don't think mm -hmm. you can actually design for a future excavation. Uh, on the front side of the retaining wall, because uh, if 
first thing is who is going to tell us that uh, this is the kind of excavation they are going to do if that is information is available then you can just delete that from your calculation and design a higher retaining wall like if if they are going to excavate one meter in front of your retaining wall then you are designing a retaining wall with uh, that kind of uh, depth considered in your analysis then of course your retaining wall will, will become conservative so mm. i don't think there is any easy way to that if, if there is an excavation plan then you just consider that and you design your retain, retaining wall accordingly but i strongly recommend not to do those kind of things because you never know if you allow uh, you know uh, um, digging in front of the retaining wall there is no guarantee that they're going to dig to the exact point where you have designed so i mean you know it's it's very difficult to design for future things i mean for public works it's easy because they are they are in control government is in control of what's going to happen on the other side but with the private especially in the residential construction we don't know what your neighbor is going to do mm. hope that answers the um, question I, I saw a good question which we haven't had thrown at us which i think if we've got the time um, uh, it might, even, it might answer what happens if you've got shallow rock yes please um, uh, russell i will make this our, our last question sadly it may well in fact answer the gentleman from northern territory as well um, we have in the past had to handle a situation where couldn't afford to drill a hole on the rock for a range of reasons vibrations of the adjoining property so what we chose to do was to have our vertical member go up and then come down and then go at right angles and create an l shape and therefore put in a foundation at the end of the bottom and then under the vertical component so as the soil pressure pushes over it it then puts a force into the ground away it's not as difficult to do and it gets you past having to drill in the rock okay so it's a technique but equally if you're retaining materials which may well be behind the question from our northern territory person if you use an l shape structurally as you build up your dirt or soil or clay or um, you know minerals whatever you load it onto your wall and then it loads onto the wall so one load on the horizontal part of your creature it's the old l shape that's used for small retaining walls where you're retaining gravel sands cement whatever okay but that will handle it and you steal that idea using a horizontal steel component instead of a vertical steel component and you can design your way around that it's not as difficult as it first appears okay thank you thank you russell and as always with these sessions we have um, run out of time and i do want to thank everyone who sent questions through and i do apologize for the ones that we didn't uh, get to answer but we will be doing other series like this going forward um, so please um, join me once again in th thanking bishu balakrishnan and R russell brown for their time and input um, I'd also like to thank Engineers Australia's industry partner, Austral Masonry, for their ongoing support. And please, if you could take a couple of minutes to complete a short feedback form, which is linked in the description box below, to help us improve and plan future sessions. Thank you again for joining us, and we hope to see you at our next Thought Leaders event. And good evening.